Hey everybody, welcome back. No fancy intro tonight. We have a lot to get through. It was good to talk about the S&P 500 very quickly here. You just kind of see you're in that doji range. You're just waiting really for the Fed to come out. We had some action in a couple different areas and we're going to discuss that and what to look for. NQ, the same. You're just kind of sitting right in that area. Now, if we drill into this, you can kind of see how you're still pointing down. You're unable to get through some key levels. The RSI is falling down. And also the VIX is still trying to rally, but coming back. Now let's clean that all off for a minute and just dig into this. So we tried to rally on the VIX and then you pulled back. If you look at this on just a simple five minute chart and overlook at your day, uh, you kind of see how this played out a little bit where opening up rallies and then they're selling it down. It was pretty much light volume across the board. We had the gap down and then the gap fill in a lot of names. But overall, the VIX never really even got back to where you closed. I thought that was somewhat interesting, and I think that's worth paying attention to for sure. If we look at the underlying, what I consider issues, I guess is the best way to say it, like the dollar, and we just look at how the day played out on the dollar, I, you really didn't do anything of substance. In other words, we didn't have this huge rally in the dollar that everyone's waiting for. Everyone's kind of sitting on their hands waiting for the Fed. And you look at how you're starting to slope a little bit here. And I'm just using a 15. You can kind of start seeing the slope 15 minute chart when I say I'm using a, a 15. But I think that's really pertinent where you can start to see that you're making these lower highs and you're, you're not really making too many lower lows. You're starting to, though. So I'm starting to see somewhat of a pattern here a little bit, guys, where you're shooting down a little bit, maybe a little curve coming. I think this is worth paying attention to, candidly, and it's one of the things I'm focused on. Uh, we're going to dive into hedge funds this evening and their exposure to the, the dollar, which is absolutely through the roof. Uh, and when you see it, you're going to be, I think you're going to find it shocking. So make sure that you, you watch that. I do want to go through a couple names, specifically uh, some trades that we had. I get asked a lot to walk through some trades. But we're going on this premise that we're going to see the 200 you know, continue to curl up. We're going on this premise that the 55 is going to curl up with it. And we're going to get this cross. And let's look at that cross right here and see how this is going. And you know, is that something that we have to pay attention to? Yeah, it is. This is something I want to pay attention to. Uh, the, these crosses don't carry as much weight if we go sideways. In other words, if we cross and then we stay in the same range, um, they're not really going to matter as much, right? It's not going to be a thing. Um, you know, I really think we have to kind of pay attention to it and see how this is going to go. But I do think that it's something that we have to pay attention to, and we're going to go sideways in here and just really see how this plays itself out, and we'll go from there. So I think that that's very pertinent for us, and just let's not get too excited about what we're seeing in here. Let's just kind of let this play itself out. And I think the dollar is really where the action is, more so than even looking at the 10 year. We'll have to watch that this week. But if we drill into, for example, we take a look at the ES here. Let's clean all this off and go from there and really see how this is all going to play out. We'll see how this goes. Well, first and foremost, you can see the what? Lower highs, right? And so that's definitely something we want to pay attention to. So we're going to want to watch this. And I think that's pretty important for us to pay attention to. And you can kind of see again where that high came in right when Japan made that announcement. And we've never been higher since Japan made that announcement. We went over that about a month ago. But this is, I mean, pretty clear stuff, guys. And, you know, people were always laughing. I'll show you a couple head and shoulders today. They're like, oh, it's a head and shoulders. I keep saying, is it? Maybe. Uh, meanwhile, while you're waiting for that, this is what we're doing. And it's been a month, month and a half. So, but I, is it head and shoulders? Maybe it is. You know, we're going to find out. We're going to find out eventually. If we do, you might see some kind of action that way. Uh, going into the Fed, but I just don't, I just don't see it. And uh, I just don't see that we're going to get anything definitive out of that. But now what I, what I don't like is, all right, let's say that you have this head and shoulders that's here and that this is developing and you can have many head and shoulders in these head and shoulders. And you know, we talked about one back here a long time ago, and obviously that one triggered and you can kind of see that in here. And then you rally to this level. So this is a level we really want to pay attention to. And you can see how we hit that on Friday and just fell apart. Uh, you get that left shoulder, head, right shoulder. I'm not saying I don't see it. What I'm saying is maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But by the time you get to the neckline, the, the trade's over. What I didn't really like was this today. And I was pointing this out in the pre-market live. And I would suggest that if you have the time, you watch the pre-market lives, if you can make them. You can't, they're always on replay. And I would suggest that you kind of go from there and look at them. Uh, we have this one trend line right here that I would look at. And then you have another one right here that you slaughtered today. Uh, actually, yeah, you slaughtered on Friday at the beginning of the day, but you're right in here. And it's definitely something that I'd pay attention to. This longer one that's here, you seem to be riding that seems to be respecting it a little bit more. So if we just take this one out and that off, we can remove them all. And just look at that. Does, does that seem like something that's able to get out of its own way? 
to me, it just looks like everything that it creates, you just start having more and more issues, right? Doesn't it seem that way? Every time you create a new high, uh, you're just creating more issues. If you drill this across, you can kind of see those issues right there. Now, you are having pockets of strength in this market. Energy is definitely one of those pockets. And I'll just look at this on the hourly. But you know, what was interesting about energy today is it really didn't move as much as crude moved. And when you start seeing that, a lot of that might be baked in. So if you start to see that, you want to pay attention to it. Like, for example, crude went up today. Energy names really didn't go up, uh, and especially even like the XOP did not go. The XOP, there we go, did not go up today, which is the, the one that I usually play the exploration. Let's clean that up. And why, why is that troubling? I'll tell you why, because this should have followed through and I'm not getting that. I'm getting this just a lot of nonsense up here. Now, maybe it needs a rest. Maybe it doesn't. But let's go and look at that on a daily really quickly. We have a lot to cover, so I'm trying to pack it all in tonight, and you'll have to bear with me. That's why we're doing this kind of raw and unedited. But you can see right here, trying to get through, can't, tries to rally, can't, cut back. Okay, that's definitely something for us to pay attention to, right? We're unable to hold, and I'm going to get into this later as well, but... Look at this island right here. Now, I've got a gap here, I've got a gap down, and I've got an island sitting right there. The other pocket that's really interesting, and we should dive into this in great detail and talk about what corporate insiders are doing here, because it's absolutely fascinating. You're at one of the highest peaks that you've been in a long time here. Uh, if you take a look at the XLF, this is actually setting up, and it actually looks fairly decent. And you know, very few indexes, or sectors rather, have the 55, the 22, 12 cross pointing up and are finding support in these areas. Even though you're hitting these DTLs, if you just click off of this for a second before we dive into the corporate uh, insider buying and selling, rallies doesn't make the lower low, makes a higher high here and still holds the line. That's really kind of impressive, isn't it, going into a Fed meeting. Let's take a look and see what corporate insiders are doing. In front of us is a stochastics model. It determines hedgers combo, hedgers combo. Blue is the hedgers combo, S&P. This reading is calculated over a one-year period in stochastics form. As always, it's very important for us to know what exactly we're looking at. This is by Sentiment Trader. I use them all the time. I have no affiliation with them whatsoever, but they do put some good analysis together and some good charts that I frankly saves me a lot of time. And the data is obviously from the futures market. Now, let's talk about how this is calculated and what it is. If you're new to the channel, one of the things that we tend to do here is we want to drill into this data. We want to know not only how to make money off what we're looking at, but how is it calculated? Because if we understand that, then we can understand how to utilize it most effectively for our trading. Time frames long term, updated weekly, and it's updated weekly because that's when they release the CFTC data and you know the net positions of these hedgers. Now, how do they construct this? The chart reflects positions of large, smart money commercial hedgers. Smart money is what we refer to as what? We don't refer to them as this. We refer to them as institutional money because they are larger. They're not always smarter. Commercial hedgers in the S&P, NASDAQ, Dow, you get it. Combines the full contract and the E-mini adjusting for contract size. So it weights according to content contract size and it calculates the dollar value of the hedger's position. So this is a really important line. It adjusts for contract size and it calculates the dollar value of the hedger's position. And then it weights that. And by weighting that, that's how you know that you're getting that the actual size there. That's really very important. The chart shows a one-year stochastics of this data, meaning 100. You're never going to get over 100. Hedgers are most exposed and they have been in a year. If you're at 100, it's the most exposed hedgers have been in one year. They are generally a non-contrary indicator, non-contra. Think of it that way. In other words, if they're, if they're bullish on this indicator, you should be bullish. If they're bearish, you should be bearish. So when hedgers are extremely exposed, above 80 can be a good sign. Conversely, below 20 is a bad sign. Now let's take a look at how this has played out over the past five years. Now, over the past five years, you can see the 100 here, and you can see our little mark here, and that kind of marks that bottom. And you see the 100 right here, and we could see the 100 here in the downtrend, and we could say we have the 100 right here, and you got a little one right here. Are we comfortable with that? How about this? And do we like that? We like that. I think that's pretty glaring. I think it's kind of interesting that we actually bottomed here and that you really didn't get that hedger's position in here, but you were still above the 80 that, that they're looking for. But what I'm looking for is not so much that, is I'm looking for the extreme readings. Now, we're going to look at this on a five-year basis. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look down here and say, all right, let's go take a look at this and say, what if we're on the other side of the of the coin and the hedgers 
are saying, well, I don't really want to be involved. Right? And that's really what you're getting here. Now, this is the pandemic and we're going to have to take this with a grain of salt. And we all know why we're going to have to take this with a grain of salt, because you had one point, what, seven trillion dollars coming into the market. So even though you're up in this area from here to here, you can see how you're up in this area. Let's clean all this off now because you get you get it. But I want to clean all this off and then we'll start over. So down here, you can see that the hedgers are getting nervous. They're at zero, they're zeroed out. Right? But don't worry about it because we have Papa Pal. And what he's going to do is just not care what the market wants and not care that we don't have participants anymore. He's just going to keep on buying assets. I think that created a bubble. We can do a whole video on that. But anyway, so it's really hard to utilize this and say, well, yeah, that was the time to sell. Maybe you could say we could use the inflection point here. This is when he said we're not buying anymore. But right? that was that December, January, where that O is area in there. That's when he said we're not buying anymore. And then you can see those peaks. This is the first time you've been down at this level since then. So it's very hard to use this data to make that kind of decision. This is why it's so important for us to know how this is calculated and what we're looking at. So what we did is we just jumped three years back and we're going to go from 17 to 19 and see how we did during that time period. And we're just going to look at these tops and see if they're marking anything. And they kind of are, aren't they? Kind of very similar. So now let's get into what we really want to get into and take a look at the zero line before we had Fed intervention 2.0 and see how we did. And we kind of look here, not really seeing that much kind of toppy, not overly. This one's absolutely glaring that you have a top in short term. And I want to be real clear about this. It's not telling you Armageddon. It's not telling you that we're going to break down forever. What it's telling you is you might have put a short term top in and you might go sideways for a couple months, which is what happened here. OK, it did not. It's not telling you you're going to do this. It's telling you you're going to do this. And then soon enough, you get to here, but you get what I'm putting down. And then you kind of come here again and look and how did that one worked? Well, that one worked well. And if you followed that, you got out of the way. So probably, again, not the worst idea. And then it picked up and gave you a bottom mark here. Now, what I like about this more than anything is instead of making it an exact science, I think if you look at this range and you look at when they're zeroed out versus when they flip either lower or higher, I think you can get a better mark. In other words, you don't know just because you're here that you're going to hit that high. But when you start coming down and crossing that line again, I think there's something to that. The important thing to take away from this more than anything for me is that one, I really, when looking at data like this, really want to limit this period in time because it was so, so marked up. And there's really no other way to say that. So it is what it is, meaning it was just so manipulated. So you have this level right down here, and that's definitely something that we're going to want to pay attention to. We are at a zero line. I'm going to be really clear about that. They cannot get less pessimistic than they are. Like they are, or, I'm sorry, they are so pessimistic right now, it can't get worse. And then you see where we are right here. Now, this is something that I think we should pay attention to. Do I think we should act on it and say, no, we have to head for the hills? No, I think you have to look at this for what it is and understand what it is and say, I need to be aware of this and how they are hedged at this particular time. And this may lead and this might lead to putting in a short term top. That's all it's telling you. It's telling you nothing more, but it is telling you that. Now, this is what I mean by mixed signals when we were talking earlier. This is corporate insider buy sell ratio XLF. Why is this important? Because this does not only mark that whether you have sellers or buyers of corporate insiders, what it does is it puts it in the ratio. And by combining that ratio, it lets us know exactly where we stand. I, I am just absolutely fascinated by this that we're so negative on financial companies and insiders simply are at 10 year highs. It's crazy to me. We are completely negative on this group of stocks. And I just want to point something out. If you come here and you just draw a line, we're at that point three and you draw a line here. The only other time where corporate insiders bought more of their own stocks, the great financial crisis. It's absolutely staggering that this is where we're at and we're having debates about whether or not financials are going to roll over. And quite frankly, anything can always happen. I mean, they're looking out years when they make these investments. They're not looking out weeks because they're, they're tied to the stock. But what they are saying is they're voting with their dollar. They're saying, no, I'm not going to sell my stock. And yes, I'm going to buy more of my company. And I think that's an extremely important distinction versus how we are, are currently looking at financials. And financials, even with the sell-off on Friday, they hung in there and they look fairly decent. Now, just to zoom in, it doesn't always mean that you're just going to automatically go up. You went sideways. It got worse. They bought more. They didn't buy less. 
They bought more, they sold less, and you bottomed. And then what happened? Look at the rally that you had in financials from the great financial crisis. I mean, it's absolutely staggering. They were buyers, everybody was panicking. You have a very similar situation going on. Not exact, obviously, but similar. And could it get worse and could they buy even more? Absolutely. Where I'm going with this is if you are long-term and you're looking at financial names, you're probably in the right spot. In front of us is hedge fund exposure to the dollar. Now, why we're looking at this is because what the dollar does is very important. The black line is the dollar, hedge fund exposure is right here. And let's look at the calculation. It's a medium time frame, hedge fund research, construction. This indicator is based off a composite of hedge fund tracking indicators. It compares the index of hedge fund exposure against returns in the US dollar to see how much exposure hedge funds appear to have to the currency. If they are highly exposed, then the index will rise more than the dollar and vice versa. What we generally see is that when funds are heavily exposed to the dollar, then it is in danger of stalling out or falling. As these funds retrench, when they are underexposed, the dollar may see more buying pressure as funds come in to add exposure. So the more that, that they're invested, the more of a concern it is that we're near a top. Do you think that hedge funds are now currently long the dollar and exposed to the dollar? And what they're saying is that usually this leads to the dollar coming in. Well, it didn't really here. They did quite well with that trade, frankly. So if we look at three years, there are periods here where kind of, you can kind of see like, yep, I can see the trough and I can see that and I can see how the trough kind of works. As far as picking the top up here, have you done it? Yeah, you have recently right here. I like looking at the most recent data. I mean, all you have to do is get over this line, but look at where we're at. So I do like looking at that data and saying, well, how do we act? Well, you do have little pullbacks there, but I think there's something to this. And I think that this is one of the reasons why we're not really seeing the dollar break out. We're going to get into this, but I think it's one of the reasons we're not seeing the dollar break out. I also think it's one of the reasons why financials are strong, because remember, when the dollar is strong, what happens? Right? You have a strong dollar, then you're going to have yields go higher. And then on top of yields going higher, you're going to have the equity market drop. Now, there's another scenario here where if let's say the economy slows down, sake of argument, and the dollar, if we slow down and the dollar got weaker. And then if the dollar got weaker and the economy slows down, well, they're still going to go out there and buy bonds and yields are going to drop and the market's going to drop. So there is a scenario here where the correlation between the dollar and the U.S. equity markets and the dollar and the bond, they can all change and equities can drop. Yield can drop as bonds are bought and the dollar can drop. That's a possibility of something that we might have to pay attention to, at least in the short term. But I thought this was fascinating that you're at three year highs on hedge funds exposure to the dollar. And I thought it was important to point out. Feel free to comment below if you have an opinion on this. I'd like to hear it. In the video, you can see the undercut and the rally. And really, all we did was rally right back to that key level. So really, all we did was a gap fill. You still have a 1222 cross of 55 starting to kind of go flat, but not really. But the 1222 cross and the 55 gives me concern. Uh, this had a reversal on Friday, which we traded off of the 55 and the break and the news. And this was a classic example of fundamental analysis. Now, if you watch Saturday's video, you're already aware of this and what transpired with Taiwan Semi. But I think it's an important time to one, walk through a trade and how you can have progressive exposure to a trade. And number two, that understand that technical analysis is not the be all end all. For example, one of the things that we always try to focus on is this stool and people love when I bring up the stool. So there it is. But what we're seeing is we're seeing macro and fundamentals drive the market. Well, NVIDIA's news was driven by fundamentals on Friday. And if you understood the fundamental story of NVIDIA, then you would know how impactful what happened with Taiwan Semi was. You would have been able to act before everybody else. And we're going to walk through this uh, with timestamps just so you can kind of have an understanding of the best way that I thought to play it and kind of go from there. But the question that you have to ask yourself is, when you're building your skill set, are you just building a technical skill set? Because if you're just building a technical skill set, you're not going to be able to sit. You're going to have a problem here because there's going to be fundamental news that's going to play with your chart. There's going to be macro news that's going to play with your chart. Very simply, I'll give you a great example before we get into uh, NVIDIA here. If you start looking at the market and understand that this low right here was peak inflation, and that's a great example that if you knew macro, what was happening there, then you could have put yourself in a position to take care of that. And that would have made all the difference in the world. You could have looked for that opportunity there and then watched that opportunity spread out. In other words, you understand the macro story. So you understand that this is peak inflation. And then you could see the technical story unfold. We have a positive divergence there on RSI. 
and I've brought up that tweet many times to me showing that and how many people were enraged by it when I said no one's going to ring about the bottom and this is how we bottomed in 16. Is that me calling the bottom? No, that is me saying that we now have a higher degree of probability that this divergence is going to lead to a bottom than previously because of what? The macro information that we had and that made all the difference in the world. Let's get back to this so we can drill into this. So understanding the Taiwan semi news, I'm not going to drill into it. I'm going to leave all that news at the end of this again for time's sake. We're not going to get into that. But by understanding the fundamental analysis and how important fundamental analysis is, that allowed us to profit greatly. Now there's different vehicles that you can use, but what we were doing off the open is we knew the semi news was bearish. We were fully aware of that. So we already knew that something was coming and how to act. There's that level and you can see the open. Everyone's getting giddy. What do you do? You gap fill right in there. And the moment that you gap fill, everybody's thinking, OK, well, maybe we're going to go flat on the day. Maybe we're just going to hang in here. And that's not what happened, obviously. And we all know that. And then what you do is you kind of have that little spot right there and you kind of get this reversal. Now, my issue with this trade was the following. I knew we had news. I knew the fundamental news was bad for NVIDIA. I didn't know how we were going to react on quad witching. So I wanted to be tempered and watch and then just wait for the opportunity. Now you can see the opening bar here, two, three, four, five, six, seven. See this wick? That pretty much told you everything when you undercut right there and you undercut this open. So that's around 9.37 and I just want to show this. So as we go forward, you'll understand. So this is a clip from the trading room. I just want to point this out. There's the timestamp so you can see it. And these are some of the other trades I did. Uh, but, and these were some swings that we had. But what I want to show you is this, we bought the 450s, we paid 180, there's the option alert. You have to understand who you are as a trader. Remember this, not everybody wants to trade options. So we also said, let's look at NVDS. And we just had some other people out there were just like, I'm just going to short the stock itself. But I want to show the timestamp for what we're going to dig into here. I think that's very important. We put the trade on and then the trade is relatively simple from there. All you're trying to do is stay up and in the trade. It's quad witching. So you know you're going to go to the nearest strike or you think you're going to go to the nearest strike. But you can see the undercut here and that pretty much told us everything that I needed to see. And then you can kind of see the drop from there. There are some other really telling signs here. For example, right here, Wick can't break over VWAP, can't get over VWAP. And then you knew you were okay because guess what you couldn't do the whole time? Get over VWAP. I'm not going to bore you with the other technicals, maybe in another video, but we still have a lot to cover. And then they just kind of walked us down. So what we're doing the entire time is we're just marking these levels and we're just using a stop loss, just a really simple trailing stop. We're not doing more than that. And when we got to a point here, I started looking at that 45 saying, you know, they're probably going to take us back to 45 at some level uh, just because that's where we were on the day. So I start looking at that level up here. Let me mark it off exactly and say, you know what, if we get up to there, uh, it might be time to go. And the nice thing about that, frankly, was we really didn't have to worry about that. And then the day just kind of played on and we just kept moving the stop down over and over. And this is the beautiful thing about this. I'm not telling the stock what it's going to do. I'm allowing the stock to do what it's going to do. I set a level where I think that you could trade to. Uh, and we went over these levels on uh, Thursday night. Then you just start kind of getting into this. And then we're starting to get into the milieu at the end of the day. And then you can start seeing that flip around here. And we start making what? A higher high. And you start asking yourself questions. So now on that trade, on this option itself, we did very well. Let me show you this so that you can see this. Let me get my little pointer here. And I'd rather do the, the instructional and educational stuff this way. Please comment below. I get asked a lot to show trades. I just think it's easier to work them into these videos as well. I think it's more timely. And then you just see here, and this is just showing what we had at 12 o'clock. I'm just reiterating to the room. This is where we're at, blah, blah, blah. These three did not work. It's very important to understand that all your trades are not going to work. Uh, that's why you cut your losses fast and you let your winners run. That's what we did here with that day trade as well. So then you look at the puts, 445 common, 5 mil to close, 4540 is where you're at. There's your stop. So you know exactly where you're supposed to be getting out. And then you look at your puts trimmed at 1025. We were in at 180. You saw that earlier. You can do the math yourself. And then NVDS, just move the stop up. What we do now is called progressive exposure. What you do now is now you've had a killing. So we're up about eight bucks on those points that puts that we paid two bucks for. Some people want to do this, some people don't. For me, it made a lot of sense, and I'll show you why technically on the chart. But with where we were on those, it made a lot of sense. Um, put some closing them at 100% of them. Roll the 35s out. You're paying six bucks. You just made eight. So it's up to you how much exposure you want. But now, now you're going into the weekend. And at the beginning of the day, you had no exposure to NVIDIA on the short side. Now you have a full short position in NVIDIA, and it's paid for by earlier exposure. 
So essentially, you have what I refer to as a free roll or free position. Now, some people say, well, that's not really true because you paid for that, you took that risk. That's true. But my equity curve Monday morning, if I lose that entire thing, is going to be the same equity curve that I had Friday morning. So what did I lose? I lost a day versus the, the, the amount of reward that you could have, risk versus reward. That's the game. Now, for me, this was a very simple idea. We're breaking the 55 again. I use a 55. This is 22.12. You guys should know this by now what I use. And then when we gap down today, just made life very easy. It was a very simple trade from there. So the trade worked the way that I thought. This usually happens your first day under the 55. Remember this, the first day under the 55, if you got the wind at your back, meaning the indexes are under 55.2 for roughly the first time in a while, you kind of can get moves like this especially when people that took the weekend to digest that news. Why? They don't have a stool. They don't know what fundamental analysis is. So it took them a while to figure out what was going on when we already knew. See how you're always looking for an edge, you're always looking for inches. And then all we did was this. And let me blow this up and show you this. And again, comment on this guys, because I do think this is worth our time to dive into so you can see how this stuff is actually done. So I'm just gonna leave that there. And you can see the timestamps. And this is Apex typing in the room for us. Uh, when I live trade, I do not type at the same time for obvious reasons. Um, and then we're looking at the tape this morning early. It was obvious they were coming from NVIDIA and Google. Uh, off the open, I'm t saying I'm gonna trim into the NVDS. Uh, we open, that's the bell, shocker, he uses a bell for the symbol. Uh, we were up, we had a double right off, the, right off the rip. He didn't understand what I said. I was just saying we got a double, I'm probably gonna trim into it. Uh, then I'm stating what to do. Apple, you saw Apple move today. Goldman Sachs had a nice call on that. That's why that one moved. But if you dig into this and you can start saying, hey, these are the levels we have to watch. We have to watch these levels. We never got there, as you can see right there. Uh, NVDS, make sure you trim. SOSX, I'm in. Uh, but you see, sold, I sold off the open sum. Let's see what NVIDIA does with the opening price now. What I've done is I've outlined this entire trade before it's executed. I've outlined this entire trade before it's executed. Puts, 15, we paid six, so up to 3X. It's more like two. Uh, by the time we got out, two and a half, something like that. There's a lot of slippage this morning, obviously. And then I closed the NVDS day trade into it. We were in at that at 37.87, got out, I guess, around, I have to look at the tape, maybe 39 and change, 40 and change. I have to go take a look. And then we're talking about Tesla. The important thing to note is we had the entire trade marked out. And what that does, let me remove this now. That removes any doubt on what you're going to do. And then all I was doing, once we trimmed in to the weakness. Why do we trim into weakness? So we can get positive slippage. Now, there's two things I want you to take away from this that are really important. Number one, the entire trade was mapped out before I did it. Number two, would I have held the size of position I did in options over the weekend had it not been paid for by what I did on Friday? No, not a chance in the world that I would have had that size of a position for me on in an option trade over the weekend. But considering that it was paid for, it made sense. A lot of this is money management, guys, besides win-loss ratios, and you'll learn that. But the moment we flipped, that was it for me. You can see the back test from here. I'm sure people did very well on the long side with this too. Uh, that really wasn't my gig today, but you can kind of see how we're acting in here. So I hope that was helpful. Uh, I plan on cutting out these clips eventually and going from there, but I thought it would be really helpful to walk through this. Now, what do I think is gonna happen here? I think people are gonna get excited and think that the bottom's in. You might get another day out of this some rally, but we have really weak volume across the board. So the question is, what do you want to do? Do you want to get involved with that? I don't think it's over, but I don't know that I want to commit a tremendous amount of capital in anything before we see how this plays out. Now, we're seeing oil move. We're seeing those oil names fly. And I know people are looking at them, but I'm just going to be you know, really blunt here. Uh, I'm on the other side of these trades right now, guys. The, the amount of movement that Arch and AMR have had, uh, I'm looking for shorts, which is kind of crazy because that's not looking like something you would short. But these things have just moved so much and all of a sudden everybody needs to be in these coal trades. And now I'm starting to see some weakness up here. And when you start seeing like an RSI of 93 on a daily, there's not a lot of room and a lot of places to go. If you, let me reset this and drill back into this or you get rid of the vol. And I know this is like a pretty weird call that a lot of people aren't making. I'm not saying that coal's falling to the ends of the earth. What I'm saying is that when you get up to these levels, like here you were at 130, you pulled back to 99. I'm not looking for coal to drop to all the way down, but for me to come down and say I could have a 10 or 15% drop, I think it's there to retest this neckline. I don't see why you couldn't see something like that. The troubling thing for me is I watch crude oil go up and I watch coal go up. This is really like mind boggling. Let's throw in tan and let's get rid of everything but. So I had an actual bottom call here for, for me on like the mark indicator I use on solar. And I think this denotes talking about because 
this it looks like it's about ready to get decimated. So I don't know if there's something going on in that space that's decimating these names, but this is definitely something we have to watch. I mean, look at this SEDG. This, this, thing's, this thing's falling off a cliff. Like, there's really no other way to say it. Since earnings, people were pretty positive about the, this earnings, and I, I have not had any kind of like real sustained higher high. I mean, you're just literally falling off a cliff. Uh, if you can't hold here, which you have already broken right in here, I don't know where you're heading. Maybe you're, he maybe you're heading to this gap fill, 118. Maybe you'll hold that. So when you start really digging into these names, and you know, even, even you know, Goldman, I read a lot of Goldman stuff on purpose. I like their stuff a lot. So I do a lot of research during the weekend. If you watch the videos, you'll pick up that research. And one of the key things that got me, we had a first solar trade, which we actually, we paid money on. We bought it at like 182 off the dip here of this hammer it traded it up and then moved the stop to break even you'd like to do that when you're trying to catch a falling knife right you want to take something out and then just make sure the knife doesn't come and cut you on the way back down and then and then it just went to i'll, I'll use clean language heck in a handbasket and um I, I really don't know what to say about it but that looks like you're getting ready to fall off a cliff so if you are somebody that likes to short names, this thing looks like it's ready to break. I mean, all the people that tease me about when I say the index doesn't look like a head and shoulders, and then I say maybe it is a head and shoulders, up, left shoulder, head, right shoulder, neckline. This one, this has my attention. Why? Because you're on the neckline. You've already broke it. Candidly, you probably could short it overnight and then just use that high as your stop if you're adventurous. You have the Fed on Wednesday, you have to expect light volume tomorrow as well. And you're not really seeing a whole lot of names hold here. You know, you're not really seeing Tesla hang in there. That should have hung in there today and it didn't. Uh, if I had to tell you my best looking chart or the best looking one that I'm in right now, out of all the names, this thing's just a monster. A firm has not looked back. I've had a couple little holds in here and that's really it. But the majority of names, I'm trying to go flat into the Fed as much as possible. Uh, if you're in the community, you're fully aware of this. There are some names out there that look amazing and that are holding up amazing. Now you have this Google that looks like a monster. Someone should tell it that the market's correcting because nobody did. Um, the other thing that's troubling for me with the oil space in XLA, I just wanna point this out, you're unable to make a higher high here. So let's just go through this. Here's crude oil and you see how crude's moving up. You have the doji and crude's moving up and this is obviously today. And then you obviously have the futures market, the time of recording this. What's getting me is oil made a higher high, energy, the index did not make a higher high. All right, how about exploration? Exploration did not make a higher high. Matter of fact, I have an island. I have an island in here. I had exposure to this uh, index and I closed it. And I have an island in here. I, I don't wanna play with this. I don't wanna see if it comes back down. Remember, if the market gets hit, if Powell does something, which I don't think that he's going to, and we'll cover it more tomorrow, if he does, I'd be really, really careful here. And I'm a little concerned as we went over earlier about the position of the dollar. I think that too many hedge funds are exposed to the dollar, but at the same time, the amount of corporate people that are insiders that are buying financials is absolutely staggering at this point and something that we have to take note of. Now, also Netflix, there is nobody defending this name. No one is defending it. I mean, not one investment bank, and I do look at this, remember the stool, I do look at investment banks and what they say a lot, and nobody is defending this name. This to me looks like, you wanna say it with me, left shoulder, head, right shoulder, and you're on the neckline. So now you have two neckline, head and shoulder trades to watch tomorrow for those guys that love their head and shoulders. That's it.